We're coming to you today from Philadelphia, where we're at the Above the Law Academy for Private Practice Seminar. This is Bob Ambrogi. Hi, I'm Carolyn Elephant. This is Gaston Krub. And Andrew Dick. And we are on the road with the Legal Talk Network. So we've just done a program here today on a level playing field, how boutiques can compete for sophisticated and lucrative business. And uh, the three panelists who are with me today on today's program all have unique either solo or small firm practices in which they do exactly that. So what I want to do is to kind of just start by going around quickly and asking each of you to give us the uh, nutshell version of your practice and what you do. Carolyn Elephant, let's start with you. Hi, I have a small firm in Washington, D.C. I focus on power, pipelines, and property. So essentially, I represent uh, renewable energy clients and other emerging energy companies. I also work with landowners impacted by pipelines, and I represent them through the related eminent domain proceedings, which involves federal court litigation. Gaston Krug. Yeah, so uh, I uh, am a patent litigator focusing on intellectual property. Uh, I run a uh, boutique firm in New York City with two partners and an associate. We do everything from pharmaceutical cases to consumer products and everything in between. We also uh, occasionally uh, get involved in trademark and copyright disputes. And we also run Markman Advisors, which is a consultancy for investors who are interested in the outcome of intellectual property disputes that will have an impact on stock prices. And last but not least, Andrew Dick. I'm a corporate attorney. Uh, spent a couple of years at the big law firms, went off on my own about three years ago. I do a decent amount of mergers and acquisitions, uh, smaller size deals in sort of the one to five million range. Uh, and then I do a good amount of venture capital work, startups, financings, uh, as well as general corporate matters. So the theme being going after the sort of sophisticated and lucrative work, uh, how much was that your intent when you started your practice? How did you get into doing that kind of work? Carolyn, we can ask you. So when I started my practice, it was my intent to actually work for large energy companies. And my business model was to basically undercut larger law firms. And that actually, I sort of fell flat on my face there. I had to change my model a little bit because I discovered that as cheap as I was, company was not necessarily going to hire me. And so I went back to identifying uh, smaller companies where I could still use my expertise and kind of worked my way back up to larger clients. Gaston? Well, for my part, one of the real advantages of breaking out of the big law mold and and moving into our own practice was actually the opportunity to expand the client base. As a big firm patent litigator, I had spent over a decade representing the same types of clients in the same types of cases. Now, patent litigation itself is inherently interesting because the technology is always different, but the idea of being able to work with solo inventors, investors, large companies, small companies, expanding the client base was really one of the drivers of opening a boutique firm in the first place. Okay, and Andrew? I had to pivot my practice a bit. I, I did predominantly M&A, uh, large scale M&A, and, and I certainly knew that I wasn't gonna be getting any of these billion dollar M&A deals that I was doing at the firms. Uh, so I moved into venture capital uh, knowing that it would be pretty easy for me to get startup clients just being sort of a similar age and generation uh, and that's somewhere where I could really compete with the big firms for that kind of work because of the, the relationships that I'd be able to build with the clients. Of course, you have the advantage of being in San Francisco where there's a, a yeah, fair share I mean, of Yeah, I started uh, three years ago right in the boom, um, and it's still a pretty healthy market. I mean, the, the number of startups that I see that I come across is pretty significant, and there's just a lot of that work, and, a lot of them, and there's a lot of money, too. So there's a lot of financings, a lot of interesting transactions. I'm in the right space at the right time. That sounds good. Uh-huh. So how does a small firm lawyer, either just starting out or even with an established practice, start to get a foot in the door of going after this, this more sophisticated work. What, what advice do you have for how a smaller firm or a solo can go after what maybe is sometimes traditionally the domain of larger firms? So, um, as I said in the presentation, one of the pieces of advice I would have is to maybe either start small or look for underserved segments of the market. When you're dealing with a specialized market, 
even though you may be working with a smaller client, their issues are still going to be the same as those of a larger client. And so you can kind of cut your teeth on representing those smaller clients, either getting more experience if you don't have it or getting exposure in the industry and building a reputation. And so for me, that was the easiest way in. I started out with marine renewable energy technology, which was, you know, extremely nascent and really wasn't much of an industry at all, but the work that I did there got me exposure in broader renewables area and the energy regulatory industry in general. And so as I built the reputation, I started attracting larger clients in that space. And how about you, Gaston? Well, as I also said during the panel, I think it's very important before you jump out to identify the market segment that you're trying to meet and be very realistic with yourself about whether or not your skill set is equipped to deal with the current market demand. And if it's not, then you have to, you know, take steps to build your reputation in a particular area or build your knowledge base in a particular area in order to service those kinds of clients. The assumption is, though, that when you jump from, uh, you know, uh, a larger law firm or if you start a small firm from scratch, you're coming in with at least some core competencies and those are going to be the ones that you need to focus on to pay the bills while you market out and branch out into trying to get the more sophisticated work. So start with your core competencies, identify where the market may have a need or an interest in a lawyer who could develop you know, additional services or additional help, and then make sure that you have the skills to provide that when the opportunity arises. Right. And Andrew? Uh, I think first and foremost, you need to target fee-sensitive clients. Uh, you know, you want sophisticated clients, but you also need to target the fee-sensitive ones. If client's not fee-sensitive, you're not going to get the work. So start there and, and, and you get to really just, you know, hustle and convince them that, you know, start with some of the smaller works, try to convince them that for your, their smaller, more routine matters, those are the types of things where you can provide great value. Those are things that you're very accustomed to doing, that you spend a lot of time doing in your prior practice. Um, and that they should trust you with some of that smaller work, and there's not going to be a lot of risk if you're talking about smaller work. And then you work your way up to the more sophisticated work as you build the relationship and the yeah. trust. Well, you say provide great value, and one of the things we talked about on our panel was overcoming the bias that some larger clients will have against a solo or small firm. So what is the value? How do you pitch the value of a small firm practice over a larger firm client? Yeah, well, I mean, value, it, predominantly, when I'm referring to it, means price and rates. Uh, and not just rates, but overall fees. I mean, as, as a solo, it's not just the rate that's usually significantly less, it's the overall fee because you don't have this layering of fees that goes on in law firms. And so we're just far more efficient as solos. If, if we have a certain matter, we're going to sit down, we're going to knock it out, we're going to do it. It's going to be X number of hours at our rate, and that's going to be the fee. So uh, that's one piece of value. The other piece of value is, is that personal service that, that I think solos can provide that a big law firm cannot. Just being able to be at your client's beck and call. And I think the, the service that solos provide is, is far superior than what a big firm can offer to a smaller client. So those are your two areas of, of value. Castle, what about you? How do you address that sort of bias towards smaller firms that some larger clients might have? So being a patent litigator, we have a little bit of a head start since IP was traditionally the realm of boutique law firms. Yeah. And then when I started, it was in the middle of a shift from the boutique model to big law firms wanting to have IP departments. And I think due to a lot of the economic forces at play, there is more of a need for boutique firms to service the type of work that we do. So we have a little bit of a head start in that clients, even sophisticated clients, are comfortable with the idea of using a boutique firm for a particular patent case. But where we do have to be a little bit ruthless and competitive is distinguishing ourselves from a particular team at a big law firm that we may be competing for a particular case against and say, look, we've done these types of cases. You know, you're getting three people in our case that are partner level people that are going to be working on the case from day one and contrast that with the big firm model where, yes, there may be a more seasoned trial lawyer at the top of the pyramid, but the day-to-day -day work is actually going to be done by people that are much less experienced than we are. So you have to look for your competitive advantages and press them. Yeah. Carolyn, do you have anything to add on that point? Yeah, I mean, mostly just as a um, to reinforce the point about the service. Uh, recently, I was working on a team for a particularly large landowner, and the head of the team was actually interviewing a lot of DC firms, many of which were bigger than mine. And even though I felt my experience was superior to them, uh, the reason I ultimately was selected was because I was responsive. I returned the phone calls, and I remember taking the first call. I was driving on this winding road, you know, on a 
college tour with my daughter, but I took the call and I was able to respond to the inquiry. And so I think that, you know, being available um, ultimately is, is something that gives you an edge over other firms that may not return your call. And you also look like you're making the client a priority. Something I thought was really interesting in our panel was that you all had kind of ancillary ventures of one sort or another that have, that have helped grow your practice. Why don't we just talk briefly about each of those and each of what you're doing in that regard. Carolyn, you can go first. So my model is something I just started. It's called Power Up Legal. The site is up. And essentially, it grew out of my need as a small firm to be able to bring on other attorneys who had expertise. I found that when I had a need for someone who could do a motion to compel, very easy to find. If I needed somebody who could appear at a regulatory hearing, it was kind of difficult. I also found that there were many times where, and in those instances, sometimes I'd have to refer a case out to a firm because I couldn't find anybody to do it on a contract basis. And so I saw that there was a need where I could you know, take a piece of what I was referring and take advantage of the marketing opportunities that I already had and also take on opportunities where I might be conflicted out, but where an independent platform contracting other attorneys could still do the work. So it's kind of a way of, you know, you split yourself up and you can leverage different opportunities. So it won't necessarily help build my practice. It'll help leverage the capital that I've built in my practice that I can't necessarily expand there and give me an opportunity to expand it on a broader level in an alternative structure. Interesting. And, and Andrew, you've done something just this week that, that's yeah. a, little, a, little a little bit similar. similar. Yeah. yeah, so we launched uh, an attorney network this week. It's called Select Council. It is a network of solo and small firm attorneys, all with big law backgrounds and very good credentials. And it sort of fills a couple of different needs. One, it, um, I mean, the idea is that there's hundreds of lawyers across the network, every city, every practice area. So it instantaneously gives every lawyer member access to specialists and resources. I mean, if you need a corporate attorney in Amsterdam or you need an accountant in, in Atlanta, chances are someone in this network will be able to provide you that resource. That's something that adds a lot of value to it to a solo practice. Uh, and the other thing it does is it sort of collects us, bands us together, puts us on a marketing platform so that it's easy to find these types of lawyers. Right now it's very hard to find any of the three of us up here on this panel unless you have a, a referral from somebody. We're just not, you're not going to find us on Google and you're, if you do, you're not going to trust it. This puts us on sort of a trusted platform of vetted attorneys, easier for clients to find that kind of attorney. Yeah. And Gaston, yours is a, kind of a different beast from what they're describing. And I, I understand you even started it before you started your firm. Yeah, we, um, we identified a market niche that there were very high impact market cases that were impacted by patent litigation. And we noticed that a lot of the research that investors were relying on was biased in some way, form, or fashion. You know, for instance, most people depend on research notes from a sell-side bank. Well, the sell-side bank wants to sell you stock. They don't care as to the actual result, whereas an investor wants to know. So we started Markman Advisors initially as a ghostwriting entity, and then we built it into a consultancy. But we've, you know, going back to what I said before about your core competency, everything we did flowed from the fact that it's based on our core competency of patent litigation. We could be the ones litigating those cases. That's what makes us qualified to guide an investor through understanding what's going on in any particular case. And that's really been a core mantra of ours is we've added you know, other service lines or even built technology to support what we do. It's always, is this our core competency and can we you know, use it in a way to add value for clients? The title of our seminar was how you can use technology and alternative structures to gain a competitive edge, I think, here. So I'm not sure any of you really have sort of alternative structures in the way you've set up your firm so much as uh, you have used technology in different ways. Carolyn, what about you? How have you, how has technology helped you in building your firm? So, I mean, technology has been critical because without technology, you know, with having to do paper filings and things like that, it just would not have been feasible, especially getting started. So it's enabled me to um, process cases more quickly. It's enabled me to do research more quickly. And a lot of the landowner cases that I do, I'm able to go on Google Maps and find a map of how the property looks, where the pipeline goes. I mean, you know, previously it would have been thousands of dollars to have like an airplane fly over it and get the measurements. So it helps in the substantive area of practice. And it's also helped me to market the practice. I mean, I was always able, even when I had a temporary office, I always had a website that looked really good that had a lot of resources. And so it enabled me to project a more professional image than perhaps one would have found when they came through the uh, smoky filled hall up to my temporary office space. So, 
Great. And Gaston, how about you? Well, you know, we've, particularly as marketing advisors, since we're not necessarily selling legal services, we've been a lot more active on social media like Twitter and through investor-driven websites like Seeking Alpha, basically trying to get content in front of people that we know have an interest in it and that may spur them to call us for, you know, follow-on advice or the insight that we're trying to sell. Separately, on the legal side of things, patent law and, and intellectual property laws are generally federal laws, and at any given time, our firm can have cases, you know, literally coast to coast. Without technology, without the ability to interact with local counsel easily in different jurisdictions, we quite frankly wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we rely on everything from, you know, third-party services that aggregate cases and decisions on a daily basis to, you know, extensively using e-filing and PACER and things of that nature. And also just being able to tap into intranets of partner firms that we may be working on on a particular case. You know, it just, we don't have a foot traffic or local practice. It's a national practice and you need technology to service it. Yeah. Andrew, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, just the uh, technology it makes it so easy for people to hang a shingle and, and have a practice these days. All the software that, that previously used to be just enterprise level software, uh, there's now small business options for it with very reasonable pricing. I mean, you can get every software you need. You can get your templates online. What Lexus and Westlaw are, are reasonable. Uh, you know, being able to use Google Hangouts or chats and Skype. And uh, one interesting thing I've noticed is clients almost never want to go out of their way to meet in person, which is not necessarily a good thing. But when you have law firms that are spending enormous sums on these ridiculous you know, office spaces that are beautiful, that no one's ever going to, or clients are, it, it, the world is just too efficient. No one has time to go to visit someone's office up on the 50th floor. And so it's almost like we have that advantage. You know, we're, we're spending our resources in a very efficient way vis-a-vis -vis the law firms. So just to wrap this up, I wonder if I could go around and ask each of you to give us one tip on how a solo or small firm can get started in going after the sort of more sophisticated and lucrative work. Carol, let's start with you. So I think that uh, you can, you know, leverage your existing expertise, but I guess the advice that I would give is, you know, when you're starting out, you think, wow, you know, I can charge $350 an hour. It's half of what I charge at my big firm. And, you know, I can work five hours a week and make a great living on that. And that's a good model. But Today, I think you got to think bigger. Um, you have to think about all of the potential opportunities that you can have to first build your practice and become the dominant player in that space and then look to these different ancillary models because I think that's really where the money is in the long term. I mean, there's a lot of money in expertise, but there's more money in building something scalable. So I would keep my eye on that. Gaston, how about you? Well, one thing I've actually learned from my uh, investing clients and, and being exposed to, to that industry is the importance of communication. And the hidden secret is in that in the investment world, most people are on the Bloomberg terminal. And the reason the Bloomberg terminal is so pervasive is that it gives people access in a very democratic way and a means to communicate with other people in the industry. So you could literally have a junior trader potentially getting the attention of a you know, manager of a huge hedge fund because they're all linked together through Bloomberg. What we found is you have to, in this business, in the legal business, you have to create your own networks and you have to make sure you have an effective means of communicating with the different parts of that network. And it might be different, you know, depending on who the target is. Within our firm, we use Google Hangouts a lot. We use Google Hangouts with certain clients, you know, to replicate the face-to-face -face meetings that Andrew was talking about. But other clients might be more interested in making sure that you're posting articles on the right places, um, on the right websites or on the right uh, forums. So you really have to understand that law is a relationship business. It's all about communication. Technology has made communication more democratic. And if you want to succeed nowadays, you're going to have to use that technology and make sure you're a master of communicating what your capabilities are. And Andrew, your closing tip. My one piece of advice would be to develop a, a very strong network. Um, as a solo, your clients are going to depend on you, at least depending on your practice. For me, it's a sort of a general corporate practice. So my clients depend on me to have the answers to everything or to be able to get them uh, or to have the resources that they need. Uh, I'm oftentimes sort of the one professional that they have engaged, maybe other than an accountant. And so they ask me for everything. And so to provide a really strong practice and a really strong service, being able to fill those needs and answer those questions is critical. So whether it's joining a network like Select Council or it's joining something else, uh, having a, a strong professional network is, is critical. 
All right, well, we've been talking with Carolyn Elephant, Gaston Krub, and Andrew Dick at the Above the Law Academy for Private Practice here in Philadelphia. This is Bob Ambrogi, and I'm on the road with the Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook, or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thank you.